different approach. Uh, I think one of the best things to, to, to begin to understand the situation for the Copts and how it's being exacerbated <coughs> is, excuse me, is to establish context for starters. And the fact is what we are having a hearing about tonight, or today, I'm sorry, uh, is about a phenomenon that has been going on for about 1400 years. This is not something new. Uh, the sort of, uh, and so the key to understand to where we are today is to establish the continuity from, from uh, former centuries past. And the amazing thing is when you look at history, and this is, in, this is my field, history and doctrine, when you look at these two, especially history, you will find that what happened to the Coptic people when uh, Islam invaded Egypt in the seventh century, uh, and as recorded by reliable Muslim historians, medieval Muslim historians who had no great love for the Copts. When you look at these texts, you will find that they are identical to what is happening today. And there's, I mean, it's, the parallels are just outstanding how this identical they are. And I'll just give you some examples. Uh, of course, there's the attacks on Copts in general. That has been going on. Attacks on churches. I was reading the other day from a medieval source uh, of a, a primary source from a Muslim who, who talked about in one, one, um, one emir's reign in that time, they destroyed 3,000 churches. Abduction of girls, uh, Christian girls, um, rape and forced conversions, plunder uh, in, as expectations from uh, second-class citizen cops, taking what's called the jizya, collective punishment. All of these have passed precedence for 1,400 years and are well-documented. In, in the Islam's own historical text. Now, when you look at that and you bring it to today and we fast forward to the 21st century and what we're seeing today, it, it, to me, this is the key. Now you understand that this is not an aberration, what we're seeing, this is not something strange, but rather part and parcel of Islamic history, and, and, and especially in Egypt. And um, <coughs> I, I'm mentioning to you Islamic primary sources, and I think that's important because these are not sources that were written by, uh, you know, uh, polemicists or Christians or, or non-Muslims, but by Islam's own most authoritative and revered historians and theologians. And they make it unequivocally clear that Islam, from its in entrance into Egypt, decimated the Coptic people and their churches and all but their civilization. There were a few, of course, uh, times when it was better and then it would get worse. And, uh, you know, one guy, one, one for example, person is, uh, he's known as Al-Makrizi, and he's one of the most popular and authoritative historians of Egypt, medieval Egypt. And he, again, while you read it and you see that he's a very faithful Muslim and he has no great sympathy for the Copts, he is so objective and he declares all of these points that we are talking about today. So the reason I bring this to you, again, is to show that the continuity is there. This is nothing new. This is nothing strange. Now we come up to, uh, I, I mentioned a little bit of history. I'd like to quickly discuss uh, some doctrinal issues. And the word dhimmi, which was not known before, but has become uh, somewhat famous nowadays, and including a, a new a coinage of it, which is dhimmitude. And I think that's all good, because these words need to come out in the open. It, I think it's also a little bad because they've been somewhat taken out of contest and popularized inaccurately. But the word itself, in fact, is integral to Islamic law, the word dhimmi. And from the beginning of Islam's entry into Egypt and the other uh, non-Muslim territories, uh, it, it, a dhimmi ha is a person, a non-Muslim, who of course does not accept Islam, wants to maintain the religious identity, in this case the, the Christian Copts. But to do so, they have to accept several debilitating and humiliating circumstances. And uh, this goes to the Quran. The Quran itself, Quran 9, Surah 9, verse 29 says to Muslims, fight the people of the book, and these of course include Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya, which basically means tribute to their overlords, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves utterly subdued. Now this is the Quran, and to Muslims this is the infallible word of God that transcends all time and has applied back then in the era that I'm discussing, and to many Muslims today, applies today and needs to be upheld vis-a-vis -vis people like the Copts and non-Muslims. And so what, what it ultimately means, this, this concept of dhimmi, is someone who does not want to become a Muslim, who willingly has to accept second-class citizen status, and whose rights ultimately depend on the goodwill of the Muslim overlords. And another seminal uh, uh, treatise that was written and uh, goes back, and uh, it's called the Pact of Omar, named after either the first caliph or uh, probably another caliph by the same name. But this pact, again, when you read it, 
it was what Christians had to sign in order to not be molested and destroyed. And among the things that it says is, number one, we, will, we, cannot, we Christians cannot build or repair our churches. We cannot practice our religion openly. We must show respect to Muslims. We must not offend Muslims. It even says we shall rise from our seats when they wish to sit down. All of this was in force then. All of it is coming back now in strong force. Now, all of it has been now. For example, the issue of churches in Egypt they're, as you see, they're always being attacked, they're always being destroyed. As far as the government is concerned, it's like pulling teeth just to try to get a permit to repair a church. And again, this goes to this, the, these, these pacts and these doctrines, which are so little known in the West and which seem to be just some, when you talk to people about it, they hear, they hear, hear these words and they think these are just some sort of throwback from ancient history and they're really not that relevant today, but they're immensely relevant to those and to the practitioners of the faith who think of these as divine institutions of their religion. And then there's another aspect to all of this. I've discussed the historic and the doctrinal aspects of keeping cops and others, non-Muslims, uh, suppressed. But there is a word that's not well known at all, and it was coined uh, in a few decades ago, and it's called Islamicate. And what Islamicate means is that just because Islam teaches, let's say, X, Y, and Z, but as a culture, a Muslim need not necessarily be a religious or a pious Muslim to start doing these things, because they become ingrained and permeate the culture. So seeing a, a copt as, for example, a second-class citizen, whether you're a secular Muslim or not, it, these sorts of things feed into the culture and the worldview of the general populace of Egypt. And so the radical Muslim, of course, will be more hostile and, and more fierce, but even the general uh, uh, Muslim or the people in the military who, d who do not identify themselves as radicals, because of the 1,400 years of these institutionalized uh, forms of discrimination, these ideas have become just part of the world view of so many people in Egypt, unfortunately. And, uh, but usually it, it, it became into sort of a, a discrimination. But now, as you see these Islamist parties, such as the Salafists, who are getting uh, you know, lots of, uh, I think, 20% of the vote, and what are they doing? They're going beyond little things like discrimination, and now they want to reinstitutionalize things like the jizya which again goes back, uh, this, is the, this is, goes back to that Quranic verse I read, which says, fight them until they pay tribute. Jizya means paying tribute, which is a way of acknowledging that you are a second-class citizen and you're buying your life you're, because you're, you're paying for it, you're being blackmailed. And so now these people who are being voted into the new government of Egypt, uh, the Salafists, are calling openly for the return of Jizya. And of course, it's not just a matter of money, but with the return of Jizya comes all and all of these other aspects of uh, quote-unquote dhimmitude to be expected of cops, which includes no more churches at all whatsoever, no more, you have to hide your uh, religious identity, no crosses in public, uh, and, and so forth, and all of these uh, d other types of uh, debilitations. Now, <clears throat> the, and then you have the brotherhood. Now the brotherhood, of course, uh, the problem is I think there's so many people who see the brotherhood and the Salafists as sort of, you know, one's moderate and one's radical. That's, of course, a joke. The, the Muslim Brotherhood, a better way to see it, or to give you an American analogy, is you can think of them as the Muslim Brotherhood are, are the Democrats and the Salafists are the Republicans. In other words, they're two faces of the same coin. Because in America, Democrats and Republicans, of course, have different viewpoints, but they are all based on the same source, and they are all based on the same paradigm. And it's the same for these Salafists and the Muslim Brotherhood. Whatever their little differences are, they all go back and trace their sources to Sharia law which is uh, not very, which is clear cut what it says. But also the Muslim Brotherhood are a little smarter than the Salafists because they know the game and they know they're not gonna sit up now and start talking about um, institutionalizing jizya or dhimmi status for cops. They're not gonna say that now, whereas the Salafists will say it now. But at, at any rate, now you have these two groups who are about 60% of uh, who won 60% of the votes, and their opinions of, uh, uh, of the cops go straight back to what I was discussing from 1400 years ago, which is this worldview that they are there to be plundered, kept, uh, kept suppressed, and their churches destroyed, and this is why we're seeing it all now. Now, I started earlier by saying that somewhat, we're here having a, a hearing about a phenomenon that's been going 1400 years, so why are we having a hearing? Why is this new? It's new because because we, it's sort of, this goes to some mode of intellectual history, but if you, can, if you look at what happened last 200 years of the colonial era, when, 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 the, when the Western powers invaded and colonized uh, the Muslim world, 
What happened then is, and this is a fact, is so many of the Muslims turned their back on Islam in a way. In other words, they were just secular and Islam was just something that you know, was not taken seriously. And this is well known. And, 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 we're, and, this, and, and the perfect example, of course, is Ataturk, who abolished the, uh, the caliphate in, uh, in the, uh, 1928, I believe. And, and, the, and he, of course, this was the nation which was the head of the Muslim world. So right at the early 20th century, what you had is Muslims were experimenting with westernizing and secularizing and modernization and nationalism. This is what happened. Now, during that era, yes, Coptic persecution was markedly subdued. And this is also a fact. The discrimination, the subtle things, they were still there. But the sort of wholesale attacks that we're seeing today were really not that present. Now, what this has done, though, because this, is the, this sort of, uh, or, or the, this new approach went on for a few generations, is it's created a Western worldview that does not see the earlier precedents or the past history. So now, in history classes, and when we discuss, when we discuss the history of the Middle East and Egypt, we just start talking about the, the, the Muslim world or from about the 1900s and the 20th century, where, no, there wasn't a lot of persecution, and if anything, the paradigm is that the West was the evil oppressive force and the Muslim world was not. So this, I think, has created an intellectual hurdle to understand what's really going on. And of course, it's exacerbated tremendously by the, the Western mainstream media, which, uh, as some of my colleagues has pointed out, never really reports the truth or, or really equivocates to use the term sectarian strife when you have a few thousand Muslims who go burn down a, a church and they call that sectarian strife, which in my mind uh, suggests you know, two equal, mm -hmm. equally powerful forces like Sunnis and Shias killing each other. And that's not the case, but the media tries so hard to come off neutral. And uh, I even remember during the, Mes the Mespiro ma massacre uh, <laughs> where you know, the tanks were intentionally running down and mowing over cops and killing them and opening fire, Fox News, which is considered the, you know, the conservative balanced one, was telling us about how soldiers were crying as they watched cops attack their fellow soldiers. Okay, and so, and then the, you know, the holders and the articulators of knowledge in the West have completely undermined reality. And the same goes with uh, academia. Academia, especially area studies, seems to exist solely now just to put the best spin on things and to make, you know, uh, if, the, if, you, if you're, you know, area studies uh, in Muslim world, None of, the, none of these things that we're talking about, these historical aspects, these primary sources, Quranic and historical that I quoted, you'll never hear these. And I know on first-hand experience, I was at Georgetown, for instance, for a while, and every class was based upon how either the Islamic world has been abused or how you know we have to understand them, we have to appease them, and this sort of thing. So it is unfortunate that we have all these intellectual hurdles that are making something that is 1,400 years old and so obvious to anyone who has studied this and looked at this it's unintelligible to us today, and we have to have a hearing to even start talking about it. And it is because of all of these forces, um, you know, whether they're intellectual history and, and so, sort of anachronisms, or whether it's uh, the mainstream media and political correctness run amok or academia. But this is the situation we're at, and there's uh, and there's nothing new. But I think the only the, the, the good news, apparently, is that we're still in the early stage. There's still many Egyptians in Egypt, including Muslims, who are not of that variety who are not the Salafists or the Muslim Brotherhood. And so we are not exactly in the medieval era where it's a wholesale massacre. And so I think there is some light at the end of the tunnel and th what needs to be done, of course, is to support and uh, as my colleagues all said, to, you know, aid must be conditional upon these sorts of things. We must identify and support the liberal voices because they are our friends. Uh, the idea of saying, you know, democracy, using that word and, you know, everything has to stop and end before that word is ridiculous because what's, being, what's happening in Egypt is democracy means the people are going to bring the sort of government they want. And ostensibly that sounds good and fair. But what is, what, when they bring a fascistic government, you know, uh, Hitler, for instance, the people brought him to power. The people had support for him. So that doesn't mean uh, we should, uh, uh, what I submit then is we should not always be uh, stand beholden before the word democracy as if it's this sort of sacrosanct thing. We have to understand it's a mode of governance, but what really matters is what the people themselves do create with this mode once they're empowered. And if, it, if the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists and these uh, fellows all get into power, it's going to uh, be uh, it's going to be a travesty to Copts. It's going to be a travesty to non-Muslims like the Baha'is. It's going to be a travesty to seculars secular Muslims, and it will be also a problem for the international